the collective managing South Asia's forests and farms. I'm very glad to have her here. She has, uh, a, well, a, an impressive CBU, and also she's uh, uh, an associate of the International Association for Feminist Economies, and we are very good friends since more than two or three decades. So I am going to introduce her because it, it has, I'm, I'm going to say who it is. She is Professor of Development Economics and Environment at the Global Development Institute, University of Manchester. <clears throat> Earlier, she was Director and Professor at the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi. She has held distinguished positions at the University of Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, Minnesota, and Michigan, and been President of the International Society for Ecological Economics. President of the International Association for Feminist Economics and Vice President of the International Economic Association. In 2005, she led a successful civil society campaign to amend India's Hindu inheritance law to make it gender equal. Her publications include 13 books and 95 academic papers on subjects such as property and land rights, environment governance, and agrarian change, written especially from a political economy and gender perspective. In 2016, Oxford University Press published Gender Challenges, a three-volume compendium of her selected papers. Among her many awards are several book prizes, a Padma Shari from the President of India in 2008, the Leon Tiff Prize 2010, for advancing the frontiers of economic thought and the International Balsam Prize 2017 for challenging established premises in economics and the social science by using an innovative gender perspective. Bina, we are very happy to have you here at UNAM and we are very happy to have this also in London, in the Mexican Embassy, in the United Kingdom and also in Delhi. So, Welcome, and I give you the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Alicia. Alicia Giron uh, in, is in Mexico, and she's a very old friend and colleague. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. And uh, Anna Treveno, who is in the UK, who has done a fantastic job in organizing this. And I also thank all the sponsors of this event. Um, I want to say hello to everybody globally and thanks especially to my Mexican colleagues um, and, and friends. So let me uh, let me start by first uh, sharing um, the um, my PPT and then we can move forward. You can see it clearly, Alicia? Okay. So uh, my lecture will be on gendering the collective, managing South Asia's forests uh, and farms. Now, the first question is, what is a collective? We can think of a collective minimally, at least as a group of people working together for a common purpose. Um, it could be par parliaments, municipalities, village councils, could be political parties, trade unions, clubs and cooperatives. It could be protest movements or other social movements uh, and, and so on. In fact, although we see ourselves as individuals, in fact, we are constantly interacting with and often even embedded within collectives. But collectives can be of many types. So uh, uh, they, they can be constituted for diverse purposes. Their modes of interaction can differ as can their social composition and motivation. So if you take uh, the issue of purpose, some collectives are mainly political, such as political parties uh, or legislators. Others are mainly social in scope, such as clubs or reform groups. And yet others are focused on economic gains, such as trade unions or producers cooperatives. And a few, in fact, may cover several functions. Um, for instance, when, when you think of parliaments, they legislate both um, for economic and social policy. Secondly, collectives differ in their degree of formality. Uh, so we think of formal groups as groups that are clearly delineated and have authority derived either from the state or some other body. 
uh, and they make and enforce rules. But informal groups lack both delineation and such authority. Then the nature of collective functioning can also differ. So I make a distinction between what I call agitational uh, collective action and cooperative collective action. So what, what is the difference here? So agitational action, for instance, protest groups um, are sporadic and they typically uh, are mobilized to demand uh, action from the state. Uh, whereas cooperative collective action is much more continuous and requires regular interaction and decision making, such as in communities protecting resources um, or in group farming. Fourthly, some collectives such as political parties may have well-defined ideologies, while others may be formed simply because you have a, 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 a common interest and this interest could be centered either uh, by gender or by race. Uh, fifthly, collectives can vary in their social composition by gender, by caste, by, by class, and so on. And some are largely homogeneous in, on these counts, whereas others could be heterogeneous across these categories. And then, of course, uh, collectives can have different motivations for forming, uh, or for part you may have different motivations for participating in a collective. And this could range from quite narrow self-interest to enlightened self-interest to altruism. And um, one can imagine this as a dynamic process that the, this, uh, this level of interest could change over time and you could move from uh, fairly uh, narrow self-interest to even transformative agendas. Now these um, these uh, gen they, these aspects of these collectives are also gendered, um, and especially say for instance if you think of South Asia and possibly elsewhere, um, women tend to be located much more in informal than informal collectives, unless of course there are quotas. And um, they are much more often um, in all women's collectives, such as women's wings of political parties, self-help groups, or autonomous women's groups, rather than on mixed in mixed gender collectives. In mixed gender co collectives, they tend to be more present in demonstrations or in agitational collective action than in cooperative collective action or decision making. So for instance, uh, in India, women have been involved in uh, protests against forest logging as in the Chipko movement, which many people would have heard about, um, or in the farmers movement, which is going on at present, or historically, um, like the, the uh, peasant movements of Telangana and Tebaga um, for uh, for rights in land, um, but they what is um, what is important is that although women often and frequently participate in agitational collective action, they are rarely part of the decision making forums of these organizations, and so uh, that's uh, that's something I will I will come to. So if you actually look at, uh, in a broad way, uh, the research uh, around uh, collectives, especially in developing countries, you find that uh, there has been much more focus on the low numbers in formal institutions of state governance, such as parliaments and village councils. And then there's been focus on the um, factors which underlie women's absence in these institutions or their low levels in these institutions. But there's been rather less attention um, paid to the impact of their of their presence. So, for instance, globally, you you know that there's intense lobbying for gender quotas in parliament, including in India, with some success. But if you ask what difference has that made to outcomes for women, then research on that is rather sparse. In particular, there's li little work on the impact of women's presence in collectives which are formed um, to manage economic resources with the possible um, exception of microcredit. So um, today, um, uh, my focus will be on two types of uh, collectives um, because this is, I feel, is a broadly has been a neglected area. And these are, um, uh, I would call them uh, focused on economic resources. Um, these are forest collectives and farm collectives. So the first one relates to uh, the community management of common property resources, uh, in particular forests. And the second one relates to private property resources, in particular farmland. 
Now, in both cases, I eschewed, you know, the standard question is why are women largely absent from formal collectives? So I, I, I move out away from that question to ask what impact do women have when they are present? So it's, it's, it turns a question on its head. So in this, in this context, I will also consider questions such as what proportion of women can make a difference? Uh, what would count as a critical mass? And uh, is there power simply in numbers, uh, what we can term gender in itself? Or do women also need to have to develop a, a, a collective consciousness of solidarity, what we could call gender for itself? So you, some of you will recognize the parallels between the Marxist distinctions between class in itself and class for itself. Um, and, but at the same time, I'm not implying that women suffer from false consciousness, which, which has been uh, linked to the distinction of class in itself and for itself. So I'll, uh, let me uh, now talk firstly of forest collectives, and then I'll talk about farm collectives. Now forests are, uh, are extremely important. Um, they are, uh, of course, we know that they are very important in the context of climate change, but they're also very important for most rural households in developing countries. So one in six persons globally depend on forests for items of daily, daily need. Um, one of the most important is fuel wood, and it accounts for 50% of wood withdrawn globally, something like 90% in Africa. Um, and this is typically collected by women. Uh, women also collect uh, uncultivated food items, uh, fodder items, uh, and, base, and a, a wide variety of non-timber forest products. Whereas timber is much more collected by men. And then forests, of course, provide green manure, soil, water, and so on. Um, an interesting statistic, um, an estimate was made uh, by an organization which uh, looked at the non-marketed natural goods and ecosystem services. And according to that estimate, they, these account for 47% of what they call GDP of the poor in India and something like 90% in Brazil. Uh, this is the, um, the um, uh, ecosystem serv services um, group which has uh, looked at this. It's economics of ecosystem services and biodiversity. So um, the, the, essentially, therefore, um, the, uh, in most countries, uh, forests are largely government owned. Uh, uh, and in India and Nepal, something like 96% of forest land is government owned. But what we find is that um, in the late uh, 1970s, when, you know, if you will recall the first initial satellite images um, began to show the huge levels of forest de degradation and deforestation globally. Um, and um, it, what it pointed to was the very significant level of state failure in forest protection. So on the one side, you saw state failure. And on the other side, there was the emergence of successful protection by village communities. And we, we know that there were examples globally, including in not just in South Asia, but in Brazil and in many other parts of the world. So by the late 1980s, there was a growing consensus globally in favor of co-managing forests with communities. And over 50 countries actually launched um, co-management programs in the 1990s. Now, India and Nepal were amongst the first of these. Um, India, for instance, launched its joint forest management program uh, in 1990 and Nepal in 1993. And under these programs, um, villages, uh, villagers could manage uh, tracts of degraded local forests and reap um, the specified benefits of regeneration. So by the early 2000s, India had an estimated 84,000 such groups protecting 22.4% of recorded forest area. And Nepal had something like 10,000 groups um, covering 11% of forest area. So I'll call these um, uh, groups which are protecting forests, what are forest collectives as community forestry groups, CFGs for short. Now, under a community forestry, basically villagers um, were given to protect and manage degraded forests, and this was allotted to them by the state. Just to give you an idea that the management structure of the CFGs was a simple one. It was a two-tier structure. There was a general body, 
in which um, uh, all the village households could be members. And there was an executive committee of nine to 15 persons. So both bodies uh, interactively defined the rules of forest use, the, the forms of protection, benefit distribution and conflict resolution. But the executive committee was the core decision making body. And therefore who had voice in the EC bore critically on group functioning. That is who would gain and who would lose from them. Now, people might ask, well, what is forest, uh, what is forest protection involved? And typically it basically involves that you restrict the entry of people and animals and you regulate extraction. And you can do protection in a variety of ways. You can have a guard, you can have a patrol group uh, um, and in, or uh, do an informal lookout. Now the, um, the uh, executive committee makes the extraction rules. So for instance, if firewood collection is banned, it will cause great hardship to poor women um, because uh, firewood as I had noted was a major cooking fuel and continues to be, and is largely collected by women. So um, if, you, if you see this picture, you see people fetching firewood and these are from different continents. Le on the left, you have young girls after school in Latin America, and you have a woman in old age in, in, uh, on, the, on the right side. And this is um, some village women told me that if men went to collect firewood, they would take a bullock cart, unlike women who bring head loads. So you can see the difference in technology as well. So in South Asia, um, women's inclusion in these mixed gender collectives was initially very limited. Uh, most, Indian, uh, most Indian states prescribed that there should be at least two women in each committee. Why two? Because they said one woman will feel lonely. So some states um, later raised this pres prescription to one third women. But in practice, most uh, of these groups didn't follow the prescriptions. And where women were included, it was not very effective participation because they were restricted by social norms. Now, what does it mean to have voice beyond being a token member? So I have this uh, typology of participation that you can see. Now you can be a nominal member, simply be a member of a group, but effective or empowered participation requires more than membership. It needs that you attend meetings, you speak up at them and you're able to influence decisions at least some of the time in your favor. In fact, if you think about it, um, you know, uh, this typology could uh, be applied in many collectives, including in university committees, um, because often you can be a member, but you don't have a voice and you don't, you're not able to influence the decisions. Now, typically women uh, in the uh, forest uh, forest collectives were not even nominal members and few and the uh, few of, who were part of the EC um, many of the ECs had no women uh, others had one or two women and one or two women in among 10 to 15 uh, 11 to 15 men were not very effective also because of traditional social norms many of them didn't attend meetings those who attended rarely spoke up and if they spoke their opinions they said didn't carry weight so if you if you share this picture, I've got this little line asking you, can you spot the women? So if you look closely at this meeting, you'll be able to see that the two women in red on the left hand side with their heads covered. And this is what they told me uh, in one of the groups told me that men don't stop us from speaking, but they do all the talking. So uh, the uh, of course the, the these uh, I call this I gave a term to this called it participatory exclusions, and these participatory exclusions were quite widespread. But there were some exceptions. There were some mixed gender groups which had even thirty to forty percent women. There were also uh, examples of all women executive committees. Uh, typically, this was because of historical or demographic factors, or because some local leader um, was uh, gender sensitive and said there should be more women. But in most cases, this was not the case. So I had several questions. Um, you know, I traveled across India and Nepal for several months before I launched this research. Um, and the questions were, would women's inclusion affect decisions on forest use? Would it lead to better conserved forests? Would women's class matter? And how many women would make a, a, 
how many women do you, would you need to make a difference? Now, these questions one could say are in some senses foundational for effective environmental governance. And they were the central concern of my book, um, uh, the, the Gender and uh, Green Governance, which some of you uh, may have uh, seen. Now, um, this is based on a primary survey that I had uh, conducted. Um, uh, and um, uh, I, what I basically wanted to do was I, I wanted to test whether the gender composition of the executive committee um, affected women's participation, um, rulemaking, rule violations, forest condition, and firewood and forest shortages. Now, the, uh, my data relates to some 135 community forestry groups. And you can see here, um, there were three districts in Nepal and three in Gujarat, which is in Western India. Um, and uh, the way I selected my sample was based on the exec on the gender composition of the executive committee, which was the most important decision making body. Um, and uh, it was a, a stratified random sampling. In the case of uh, Gujarat, uh, it was uh, two strata. Uh, there were uh, two women or less and executive committees with more than two women. And in the case of Nepal, I had these two categories plus one more category of all women's groups, which uh, there were rather few in Gujarat. So the first thing I tested was whether there was a threshold effect, a critical mass needed for women to participate effectively in mixed gender groups. Now, the, uh, the idea being that in the presence of other women, um, it helps individual women overcome social restrictions and personal reticence. So um, it's, uh, in fact, uh, this question of critical mass has been discussed um, uh, by a range of authors, but as you can note from this, uh, even the short uh, table, that in most cases, uh, the focus has been on legislators and on and political participation. Um, and um, this is, these different people suggested uh, different percentages, anything ranging from 15% uh, to 40% um, as being uh, effective. Uh, but um, this was not on the basis of actual, uh, uh, this was on the basis of observation rather than statistical measurement. Um, so uh, some suggested that one third was a magic number. Uh, so I began as a skeptic, but when I tested it econometrically, I found that the likelihood of EC women in these forestry groups of attending meetings, of speaking up and holding office was indeed significantly higher with about 25 to 33% women. And that's where the critical mass lay. And um, just to illustrate, here is a graph um, uh, which, which uh, looks at critical mass on the likelihood of women holding office. And as you can see, if you look at this graph, that it begins to lift up and make a difference around 25 to 30%. It continues till about 50%, and then it, it, it slopes, slopes off. Um, and so, um, of course, beyond uh, the uh, beyond, beyond uh, the graphs, uh, what do village women themselves say? And they also recognize that numbers matter. So, for instance, just to share two, um, and this is this is quite common. I mean, I'm just sharing you with you two observations, but uh, they these observations were quite common across the groups I interviewed. So, there's a group in Gujarat who says it helps to have more women because then women will not be dominated or feel shy. After all, if there is only one woman and ten men, how will she speak? And then the other, there's another group in Nepal who said, I, I know a lot about the forest, but I'm scared to speak in front of so many men. If we were in a majority, we would speak in a meeting. I'm sure many of you, even those who have been, who've studied in the West, um, uh, may remember that their mothers may have talked about it, of how um, small in numbers there were in, um, of women in mixed gender classrooms. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate in Cambridge, there were 10 women out of 150 um, uh, students in, in uh, classrooms. So, so this is not so long ago that um, you begin to see more gender balance even in other contexts. Um, so uh, essentially, um, therefore, um, consider therefore that, okay, if you, if you have a larger proportion of women versus if you don't, does it make a difference to conservation outcomes? Now, of course, as we know, especially if you're economists, we know that you have to actually control for other factors. 
So if you, if you want to see the effect of gender, then you need to control for other factors which could also affect forest condition. So I control for a range of things, uh, caste and education of EC members, the method of protection, the size of the forest, um, the village characteristics, um, and so on. So that was one part of it. The other is that you might ask me, well, how do you actually assess the condition of a forest? And so um, they, I looked at changes in canopy cover and regeneration, but the assessments were also uh, multifold. So there was one assessment which was made by, made by the research team. Another was by asking villagers. The third was by, um, by assessing on the basis of forest department records. And then I also used satellite data, uh, which was calibrated to the, uh, to the village level. So what did I find? So overall, firstly, even without gender, the majority of forests were showing an improvement simply by community protection. So here's a, in, in, here's a picture. So it's, it's something like 83% of the of these groups reported improvement. But just to show it starkly, this is a, these are two pictures. They're taken by uh, uh, by an NGO in this village, and the top picture is uh, of the same village um, uh, before protection started, and below you have after protection started. Um, it's a slightly different. Uh, it's uh, you know seasons. So it's a, partly a little bit of the effect of season, but it's not really that much because as you can see here, barely rootstock is there. And here you have actually a young teak forest. This is an area where um, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, teak. Uh, so, um, the, so then the question is, okay, if there's improvement simply by communities protecting, is there an additional difference if there's more, uh, there are more women in the management of these forests? And overall in India also, uh, incidentally, between 1991 and 2001, the forest canopy increased by 3.6 million hectares, whereas it was decreasing rapidly prior to that. So the effect of gender then. Now my regression results show that an improvement was notably better in both Nepal and Gujarat. And in Nepal, I found that there was a 51% higher probability of improvement in forest canopy despite starting with poorer and smaller forests compared to groups with men. And they also outperformed uh, the latter in, with other indicators of forest regeneration. Similarly, in Gujarat, uh, groups with uh, more than two women showed significantly greater improvement than those with two women uh, or less by most indicators and by controlling for all the other uh, factors as well. And I won't spend too much time on it, but this is uh, just to show that there is a regression. If people are interested in that, they could look at the at the at the um, uh, at my uh, results in the book and articles. But I want to mention one particular result that in one of the districts I found that the effect was remarkably strong. So here, this was Panchmahal district in Gujarat, and there was a 75% higher probability. Of, uh, of improvement in forest canopy among groups which had more than two women and did well by uh, all indicators, much reduced degraded area and much improved forest, uh, forest, kind of forest change. So the question then obviously is that why did this uh, particular district do so much better? So when I probed that, I found that not only did the groups have more women where they did better, but they had a larger proportion of landless women of poorer women. And, um, and then it, you of course uh, begin, it begins to uh, make sense that um, uh, landless women are the most forest dependent. And if they were not part of the decision-making body, uh, then they would be much more hostile to forest closure. So when they were included in the executive committee, these women could persuade other landless women to comply with the rules and they themselves followed the rules better as well. So you had a win-win in a way that you had better conservation and more equal um, benefit sharing by gender and class. So an obvious question you will ask is, well, why did um, groups with more women perform better? And the first one is that it, it hugely improves um, protection. So here I'll just give you some quotations. Firstly, there was greater compliance with rules by the executive committee women themselves. So they quite frankly admitted that we now feel that the forest is ours, but when we were just uh, the group members, but not in the executive committee, this woman says, I used to steal grass from the forest. 
But after becoming an EC member, I stopped stealing. The second thing they do is that they share information more with other women about the rules of, and persuade them not to cut branches. So again, uh, they, they say qualitatively having women in, in the group helps because often women would cut firewood from the protected forest when they needed it. Then we held a meeting and we stopped the cutting. And we also persuaded women from another village to stop cutting a forest. So here I want to, um, age also mattered, is here's a small petrol group um, yeah, of women who are going on an informal petrol and they've uh, they formed it themselves. And this is um, what they said that I, the, the chair of that uh, group said, I held a meeting with the women and we decided that some women would go together every day for patrolling. So this is an important part of the story of better patrolling um, yeah, and uh, so on. But the other factors, uh, women have a higher stake in keeping out intruders because they depend on forests much more. And then uh, something which is very key uh, in all our discussions today, even on biodiversity, uh, that uh, women have a, a, the village women's knowledge of plants and species um, and uh, how do you ecologically extract um, uh, products is not the same as men's knowledge. So typically there's actually quite a lot of, um, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, literature now that's grown, um, which shows that uh, men have knowledge, particularly of the items that they collect, which tend to be much more timber uh, related, and women have much more knowledge of the items they collect. And because women collect such a vast diversity of plants, uh, and, and, and so on, uh, and they know about extraction practices, um, they were able to suggest, make suggestions on forest improvement and regeneration, um, which the men had not thought about. So um, th there are other factors also that if you, if their preference, if they were on the executive committee, their preferences would be taken into account. And there's some evidence to show that um, conflict resolution tends to be better among um, groups. Um, which have women and there's anthropological as well as experimental uh, games literature on this. So here's just, an, just a picture to show that, uh, you know, this is a, a woman in Nepal and she's extracting tree fodder and it requires quite care and skill. Uh, when do you extract, how much do you extract so that it gets regenerated? Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's I think, uh, pretty important. So, so far I've talked to you about, about uh, forest collectives, um, uh, which as I, I showed that uh, uh, including women in the management of forests, um, whether it's all women's groups or uh, executive committees or mixed gender executive committees, um, their presence uh, has made a difference to conservation outcomes and to also to uh, by re in reducing uh, shortages of firewood. But this is a common pool resource. Forests are common pool resources. Now I want to talk to you about private property resources, which are farm collectives. Because unlike forests, which involve um, common pool resources, you don't actually have uh, that much uh, research on uh, what on joint farming, um, where people cooperate uh, around farmland. So why do we actually need farm? collectives, you will say. Well, farmers cultivate with their families. Why do we need farm collectives? Now, um, the, perhaps the most single most important reason is that increasingly, globally, farms are small in developing countries. 84% of farmers across 111 countries cultivate under two hectares. And by the way, this is not only developing countries, these also include um, uh, some parts of Europe. So some uh, farmers, in fact, don't even own the land that they cultivate. In addition, they face fragmentation, they face climate change, and you're facing a feminization of agriculture. So the question then is, what is, is there an institutional solution? Some people have been arguing that small farmers actually should not be farming, they should be doing other jobs, and we should just do much more of industrial large scale agriculture. But then they have no answer to where will all the farmers go uh, in terms of livelihoods. So is there an alternative institutional solution to this? And I believe there could be in cooperation and group farming, which could provide an answer. Now, um, what do we mean by cooperation? Everybody uses and often people use this word, but I think we need to clarify it because cooperation can be at many levels. 
Um, so here's um, uh, to share with you uh, that uh, a cooperation um, can be, there can be what I call a single purpose cooperation. This is the most common form of cooperation in agriculture, which is that you market a a product together. It's found in dairy farming in particular, um, and you, you find it in dairy farming in Europe, uh, you find it in dairy farming in many parts of the world, and India has a very large Amul Dairy Cooperative, which has 3.6 million members. Men large numbers of them are poor and uh, and many of them are women. So here's, here's a picture of the Amul, um, these two women taking their, taking their milk to the cooperative. Then you can have what I call medium level multipurpose cooperation. So suppose you have joint crop planning across ecological zones, or you jointly purchase inputs or, or, or sell output together, but the cultivation is still individual. And the third is what I call fully integrated cooperation, which is group farming. And what this involves is that you pool your land, your labor, your capital, and you share costs and benefits. And this, these are the farm collectives where small owners can be bigger producers and non-owners could become producers. Now, um, conceptually, group farming can have many potential advantages. For a start, it, it can in help increase farm size. Uh, you, it gives you scale economies. It can save on hired labor. It can bring a larger pool of funds and skills and raise your bargaining power in markets and in, with government agencies. And particularly for women, it would also provide greater autonomy. It would give them control over output and an identity as a farmer, because women are often not recognized as farmers. They are recognized only as farm wives. And this is, uh, this is seldom possible in male managed family farms and where women's contributions, as we know, and as Alicia would know as well, that are, um, their contributions are made invisible. Also, women who want to farm, but they own very little land, can get land access through a group. As we saw in forest collectives, groups can help women overcome social restrictions as well in public interactions. So you might say, well, all that is uh, fine in terms of concepts and theory, but what happens in practice? So in practice, in fact, uh, I, what I call waves of farm collectives. So the history of group farming in some ways goes back a long way and there have been at least five types of farm collectives the oldest that we can think of usually is the socialist collectivization which are best known but also infamous um, because it was forced top-down collectivization of fam peasant farms and they had serious negative effects on in on output as well as welfare but then in the uh, 1960s, um, many countries uh, gained independence from colonial rule across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And you find that farm uh, cooperatives were then promoted uh, under agrarian reform in, in these countries. And you can think of many examples, the examples from India, but there's also like in Tanzania, you had the Ujamaa uh, and, and, you know, initiative and so on. Um, but again, uh, they were, uh, they, they were supposed to be voluntary, but in many cases there was also government pressure and you found that big and small farmers were often asked to cooperate, which of course um, you know, didn't work. The third kinds of examples you find is are in Europe in 1960s. France, for instance, has a, uh, I've been studying um, not just India, but also France and, and Romania uh, for group farming. And then in the 1990s, you find very interestingly in post-socialist countries, group farming developed. And it, it came up because people got a decollectivization of land then led to people getting small slivers of land, but not large enough for them to cultivate individually. Um, and uh, there were shortages of machinery. So they pooled their resources, uh, land and, and, and resources, and you find group farms emerging in countries as diverse as, um, as Romania, uh, as East Germany, Kyrgyzstan, and Nicaragua. And then you have the two in the 2000s, the all women groups, which have a very different model, which I will come to in a minute. <clears throat> now in the first four models, where were women in these collectives? Was there gender equality? In fact, there wasn't. So even if you take something like the USSR, uh, and if you see this picture, which is a picture of 
um, men and women be equal. But the reality was that 85% of women employees relative to 66% of male employees were labeled unskilled. Only 0.8% of tractor drivers were women. So, you know, when you think of women in Soviets, you have a very different image. But when you actually see who was uh, handling the machinery, it wasn't the women. In China and also in Vietnam, women earned less work points than men, even for harder tasks. So you have uh, gender differential in average work points uh, in China in 1973 was 2.5. In India, the experiments in the 1960s um, uh, and in many of the post-colonial countries, uh, uh, they were collectives of family farms. And here again, women didn't uh, get a good deal because there was a traditional division of labor. They had limited autonomy and they were not seen as farmers in their own right. But the, to, in the 2000s, the farm collectives, which I have now studied, are quite different from all these other examples. Because these are voluntarily constituted, they're egalitarian, they are small sized, and they have been um, based on the adaptation of the self-help group model. And they are, uh, they are managed entirely by women outside the framework of family farms. Now, I examined um, uh, these um, uh, uh, farm collectives run by women in two states of India, Andhra Pradesh and Kerala. But I'll focus on Kerala, which is on the southernmost uh, part of India, um, and because it gives us special insights. And I have several papers on this, so people, uh, I'll only do a broad brush sharing, but there are several papers if you want to read more in depth about the results. Now in Kerala, group enterprises in general, not just only group farming, were promoted by the state government under its state poverty eradication mission, the Kudumshri mission. And the idea of uh, group farming actually came from village women themselves as an experiment of leasing land, but the program was then crafted uh, and enlarged by senior government officials and intellectuals. And what the base was that at the village level, they had neighborhood groups, which were saving and credit groups. And uh, members of those groups could then set up a group enterprise, including a group farming. So today, if you can imagine, there are 68,000 women's group farms based on leasing in land and cultivating jointly. It's not 10 or 20 or 200, it's 68,000. So I um, decided that we need to actually test, are these group farms uh, as productive as individual family farms? Are they as profitable? Because um, if they are not, then uh, how would policy move forward? So what I did was I selected two districts for my study. And this is, uh, these, are the, these are the two districts. Um, this is uh, Alipuza and Thishur. Alipuza I selected because it is, it's a paddy a food crop dominated area. And Thishur because it is dominated by commercial crop, uh, banana in particular. And in both districts, uh, a lot of vegetables are also um, grown. Um, I had a sample of some, and this is, uh, the, this is, this is Kerala in vis-a-vis -vis India. And this is uh, the districts in Kerala. Now, my sample consisted of 250 farms. Um, they were all women farms and individual family farms. And the individual family farms, 95% of them were male managed. Now, the data I collected was weekly data. I had a team of, um, of uh, uh, research staff, uh, and uh, including local women. Um, and uh, because, you know, Kerala has a high literacy rate, so you could actually have village uh, women living in the villages with high levels of literacy who could actually be part of the research program. So weekly data was collected for every input and output for every crop and plot for an entire year, 12 months weekly data. So there's a huge data set. And in addition, uh, held informal discussions, focus group discussions with, uh, with, the, with the groups and with individual farmers. Now, what is important is that the groups uh, the, of the farm collectives were heterogeneous. It, they included uh, women from various castes and religions and poor as well as those just above the poverty line. And this heterogeneity um, goes against the common assumption that you have in collective action theory um, and the assumption by NGOs also that if you have homogeneous groups, it leads to better cooperation. 
So why did they go for heterogeneity? Well, partly because they wanted to root the groups in neighborhoods and to ensure leadership, but also heterogeneity provides you a wider band of social capital. And this is pretty important if you want to lease in land. And there would be there were potential uh, social divides, but they tried to overcome them by rotating meetings in different women's houses um, uh, over the, uh, the, the o o over a period. Now these groups had access to subsidized credit through the agricultural bank, which is provided to all, uh, which is all India, um, and they received state support in terms of technical some degree of technical training to help them overcome some of the gender biases. But uh, the groups are small, four to 10 women. What was important is all of them were leasing in land compared to individual family farms who owned the land that they cultivated. So despite all this state support, you still had initial disadvantages that they faced. Firstly, if you depend on leased in land, it has high transaction costs and this insecurity of tenure. Then the leases are oral. So you, it prevents access from, because you can't prove you're a farmer if you have an oral lease. So you can't easily get government subsidies. And there are, of course, structurally embedded inequalities, gender inequalities in, in terms of access to land, inputs, extension services, and markets. And then uh, importantly, they had little prior experience of farm management because you know the not everybody had, uh, they would help on the family farm, but they were not managers of the farms. Typically it was the male men, male heads of households who were the managers. So despite these challenges, the question is, how did they actually perform? Uh, which is comparing all women's group farms and principally male managed individual family farms. So I was not clear that, you know, I was not anticipating what the results would be. And I find, found in fact that the groups performed strikingly well. So here's just a little sample, uh, simple table. Um, I won't present my regressions, but this is a simple table which, from which you can see that uh, this is the annual value of output um, uh, for group farms and individual family farms. And you, and you find that this is 1.8 times higher than that for individual family farms. Then if you look at the annual returns, the net returns, which is after you deduct uh, all the paid out costs, you find um, that in fact, it is five times higher, the annual net returns per farm, but also an annual net returns per hectare were also very much higher. So, uh, and, and in terms of major commercial crop banana, in fact, the yields in the group farms are 1.6 times higher than the individual farms. So these uh, results are supported by the regression analysis after you control for input use, labor, and other factors. Um, and in the regressions, you find that when you shift from individual farms to uh, women's group farms, uh, it can increase annual output by 30%. The groups also, uh, so both in terms of annual value of output as well as annual net returns, you find that the groups performed extremely well. And this, this, this is despite the fact that they were leasing in the land um, uh, and so on. Now, interestingly on bananas, you know, India is a very important um, producer of bananas um, and uh, they were able to negotiate contracts with temples for niche banana varieties. And as a group, they were more able to deliver than it is possible with individual uh, farmers. So there was another advantage of a group. So there, there are a number of uh, statistical results around this, but let me share with you that there was another very important result of forming groups. And that was what I call capability expansion. They developed identities as farmers and were not seen as merely farm wives. So here's a quotation, uh, the, this uh, group, the women said, group farming has enriched our farming experience. And this is one of the uh, lead women there. I realized that I had good leadership qualities and could even manage the technical aspects of farming. Other women also listened to me carefully. They also became uh, familiar with a wide range of public institutions. So they said before joining the group, we had no contacts with bank officials, uh, agricultural officials, government officials, but after registering as a group farm, we could start a bank account, we could attend training classes, we could develop a good rapport with these officers. I mean, they did have, they did have bank, uh, <laughs> bank accounts, but that didn't mean that they had a relationship or a familiarity with the officials themselves. But as managers of farms, um, they, 
establish relationships of, um, you know, uh, of professional relationships with these institutions. And um, they also learn to negotiate in multiple markets. So if you're negotiating a land lease, they could they needed to know what the quality of the soil was, what kind of um, uh, land that they were leasing in. If they went to input markets, they could assess the prices. They also report that they could make production decisions themselves and manage the farm. And they had greater voice and respect uh, in families and in communities. Most importantly, it was very interesting. Um, that I found that they survived economically during COVID break lockdown much better than individual family farms. In fact, out of some over 30,000 that were cultivating uh, last year in the uh, around uh, February, March, 87% of them survived economically. So that's, that's also very, very important. Now, uh, this is, uh, although Kerala is the, has the most important uh, and large scale uh, group farming, in fact, it has been also emerging in other parts of India, like in uh, Western and Eastern India and Nepal. And here you find that these are like in um, Bihar, it is which is in uh, which is in eastern India. It's much more feudal than Kerala. And here they were able to challenge feudal relations. They are economically more efficient if you form groups. The women have learned new skills of handling machinery, and interestingly, it has reduced also to some degree job search migration by youths. Of course, the scale of this is a very small scale at the moment, but it has a potential for growing. And again, these groups, uh, I talked to them uh, telephonically uh, through the NGO who was, uh, who, who, who was uh, motivating them. And again, they said they were much more food secure during COVID lockdown than individual family farmers. So, um, so let me uh, then bring in some broad reflections. What have we learned uh, about women's relationship with collectives from these forests and farm groups. Firstly, both fo forest and farm collectives have empowered disadvantaged rural women economically and socially. But interestingly, it's also empowered them politically because it has led many women from these collectives, they stand for local elections in the village council and many of them have won that, which wasn't the case earlier. And um, the um, the uh, the fact that it is uh, heterogeneous uh, collectives enhance the skill and leadership pool and also the social capital base and this is an interesting result because it goes against the grain of collectives uh, that we normally think about now um, women's numbers matter in themselves um, although strategic solidarity can improve effectiveness so simply the power of numbers makes a difference but if they also developed um, uh, a greater consciousness, they were more strateg strategic in their approach, then it could further improve uh, effectiveness. But then there is a debate. Should we encourage all women's collectives or mixed gender collectives? So I want to just um, share this with you. Um, what are the pros and cons as they emerge? Now, on the one hand, all women collectives do better in terms of cooperation and outcomes. And this was found in both forest collectives and farm collectives. And if you if you think back, if you also look at other collectives like self-help groups or microcredit, uh, like the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, you know, initially these initiatives were all uh, open to men's and women. So you had like in the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, you had men's uh, um, uh, groups and women's groups and similarly self-help groups. But you find that now increasingly more than 90% are all female groups with excellent records. Cooperation is also found to work better among all women groups. To the, because, why is it? Because women are much more interdependent because of resource scarcity and because they all face restrictive social norms. So one can say there is a particular interest in, in, in working together as a group. And then rural activists also think that all women's groups are important for capacity building. So this is a very senior Nepalese gra grassroots worker you know, who I cite. Um, she says, when women join a separate group, they gradually lose their fear of making fools of themselves when speaking up. Women need their own small groups. This is what I know from my 22 years of experience. 
but and there is a but so this is one side of the picture but the other side of the picture is that men's groups are have more economic resources and political power so women's equal presence in men's groups uh, is also needed and mixed gender groups are also essential so essentially this is what i uh, end up with that yes all women's groups uh, are important in particular context especially in the way that uh, the nepalese uh, grassroots worker has talked about in terms of building their capabilities but you also need women um, you know it, uh, you also need gender balance in other groups um, now the one question i'm always asked is what about scaling up so I want to share this different approach to scaling up. Scaling does, up doesn't mean that you have thousands and thousands of people in the same group. Um, so this is much more um, of this idea of federations that you can have small groups, small forest forest groups, small uh, group group collect um, farm collectives and forest collectives, and you can have them horizontally and then you can link them up vertically. So that at the local level, you're still interacting in small numbers and, and you trust each other and therefore cooperation can work, but then you can have representatives and you can form a federation. And in fact, it's very interesting that in Nepal has actually a, a country level federation of forest user groups. And then uh, finally, um, I wanted to say that women's collectives matter, not just in terms of that being transformative in terms of uh, women's lives and the lives of their families, but also they contribute to larger goals. Uh, one can argue that collectives offer an alternative system of dealing with market and state failures. Women's role in forest collectives improve conservation, and that's a key element in climate change. Women's farm collectives increase output, and that's a key element in national food security. And then a larger goal could be that collectives can also help people transcend narrow self-interest and move to other regarding interest and collective responsibilities. And in fact, you have examples of self-help groups uh, which have moved away from simply uh, saving and credit to, to help uh, non-members and the poor uh, as well. They play an advocacy role. So, and I think this idea about moving away from self-interest to other regarding interest is, uh, becomes very important when, it, when we are facing crises like the pandemics. Um, pe many people have talked about the need to transform food systems and other systems uh, to uh, talk about shorter value chains, uh, to talk about um, local communities cooperating. And I think for that, um, the, we also need to move away from the notion that is constantly embedded, uh, that uh, especially in economics, in mainstream economics, that self-interest is the driving force of human behavior, to the recognition that people have multiple uh, <coughs> motivations, of which altruism is also an important part, uh, and, uh, and the shift to other regarding interest uh, would be much more for the common good. Um, so let me therefore um, end um, with these evocative lines um, by Pablo Neruda, a poet uh, much loved across the world in Latin America. And this is from his uh, poem, um, Res Residence on Earth, um, that uh, advance in sweetness until the mosses take root in the thunder, until from the pulse of hand in hand, the roots descend. And the image uh, that I shared with you is in the same spirit. So thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Vina, and very nice to finish with uh, uh, Pablo Meruda. And I'm going to pass the microphone to Jacobo. So please, Jacobo. Thank you, Dr. Hiron. Uh, I will give some, a few comments. Um, I think uh, we agree that we are so honored to have uh, Bina Agraval here with us. Uh, the Professor Agraval, uh, it was a very, um, I have no words, I'm speechless. I think it was uh, splendid. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will just try to remark a few um, aspects of uh, the presentation. Uh, I think uh, some of them are very important for me. Another ones I think uh, are important, but uh, I, I, I have so many questions too, and I'm so excited. So. Please forgive me. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'd like just to uh, start from 
this decision making process i think is quite important the participation of women but not just women is uh, in another words you have mentioned this homogenous economic situation because you want to avoid this kind of imbalances uh, i'm speaking about intersectionality because we can say that, yes women but not all women are uh, the same, even in India, the diversity of the society, you can have uh, religious uh, diversity, you can have ethnic diversity, you have a, you can have caste diversity. So in this, uh, I think it's one of the most important aspects. And I don't know, it's just how to achieve or to get to this, not perfect, but so egalitarian decision making decision making process it's really important and another aspect i think is quite interesting is this research gap you have observed i mean it's so it's so uh you're so right we think that political and economic participation of women uh, must be focused on political or uh, parliamentary bodies just that like elections or this kind of representation is enough but uh in in this case you you go so local to the community and the local and even uh to some extent individual level just to uh enlighten us and 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 focus that it's not just this kind of political participation in the federal or the central level. It's the community level and the local level, which really, really matters. Sometimes we have to, I think, understand that. And uh, I don't know, uh, your research just uh, somehow uh, reminds me uh, Gayatri Spivak's work about the subaltern <laughs> and specifically the woman and in rural contexts, that's a really important, uh, I think, in my opinion, aspect of your research. Not just this, um, I mean, urban uh, contexts have a lot of, of uh, problems, but the rural uh, context is quite important, I think. And in India, in a country with a population, a large population, maybe half of the population working in this kind of context, is uh, essential to know. Uh, another aspect is the property. Property, mm -hmm. uh, well, in the case of the forest managing is understandable, it's a common good, a forest, it's not a property of anybody, it's a property of all of us. But uh, in the case of farming, I think that's a really important aspect too. Because uh, even, well, in India, in the case I know better, well, men, well, not so many men have uh, enough uh, and enough amount of land. In the case of women, of women, it's of course <laughs> much worse. But uh, even if in India you have these laws, and even um, you you have this, uh, we can say attempts to improve the uh, hereditary laws for women. It's not uh, the implementation is the problem. The social norms are the problem. It's quite difficult to try to fix this. But these self-help groups, I think, are quite uh, an answer from the local to do that and to improve this. Uh, well, people, I, I'm not talking just about women, because even these uh, self-help groups have important implications and repercussions for men too, because they can be, yes. in other words, you mentioned actually that they are hired or they, uh, uh, well, yes, they are hired or they, they, uh, their lands, uh, follows lands can be uh, leased to, well, cultivate something and they are very well paid and even uh, the product the output can be used for a, a grain fund and this is a strategy from the local for food security and the utilization yes. which is one of the pillars of the uh, food security this is i don't know it's just so local but so effective and in my opinion that's uh, one of the most important aspects of it. Uh, of course, the empowered participation of women, as I've told you, it's, it's, it's of paramount importance. But uh, essentially, I think 
the 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 mind changing aspect or the element i think is more vital is try to improve the govern governance from the local level because and as you told us it's not about this presentation is not just about uh women exclusion it's about what women inclusion can do and why yes and in this sense i think this uh this insights to improve the governance in this community and local level are really really uh vital and uh i i have been thinking about it but it's just women or empowering women's agency is so important and will give so many benefits to the society in general and you have uh, illustrated this so well that Thank I am you. amazed, amazed, <laughs> to, to be honest. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. Well, uh <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for those uh, remarks. Uh, and um, uh, let me just say, be very brief uh, in, in res uh, response and then we can take wider questions. Firstly, yep. you know, it is it is absolutely right that when we, um, you know, there has been so much lobbying for bringing in improving women, uh, bringing more women into parliament, into legislatures and so on. And that's quite right, because you can say that's important for equality in itself. It's, it has intrinsic worth. But then we also need to ask, uh, does, does their presence actually make a difference? Uh, do they bring more bills to bear? And you often find it's not necessarily the case that the women you bring bring into uh, into uh, through political parties are not necessarily feminist either so we need to actually ask well what is your agenda and what your what is your program which is not very common um uh, and 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 therefore this it has wider ramifications that what is the outcome as well i'm not saying gender equality isn't important in itself but then uh, there, 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 we can ask other questions. I think the question you you particularly um, mention is about the heterogeneity. That was, uh, you know, you had several comments, uh, and and that's a very good question. Uh, you see, in in the case of the uh, the forest collectives here, um, the uh, there is some degree of overlap, uh, especially in South Asia, between forest dependent communities and those communities being particularly tribal communities. Um, and, and so um, in these groups, 80 percent or more were, 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 were tribal communities. And therefore, the, the kind of issue of caste in India, caste would be pr probably the most important apart from class, um, was less um, apparent. In the case of Nepal, caste was important. And I found that it did make a difference. Um, but interestingly, the uppermost caste, the Brahmin caste, the women in any case didn't go to get firewood. So they it didn't they they so it didn't create the kind of elite capture idea that is dominant in social sciences uh, and so on. Um, it doesn't mean that the that the issues won't arise. It they can arise, um, but um, it it's it's they're not always the dominant issues. I also found that in many cases the richer families said, "Well, we are not so interested in putting in time to protect the forest, and we have our own land." And so they were they they didn't actually impede or interfere. Um, but this could change if you if your forest is very valuable, suppose it's very valuable, um, you know, uh, forest which is which is uh, this these forests were not that valuable, but the very valuable forest, there could be a conflict. So we have to recognize that. Um, the um, in the in the um, uh, Kerala groups, uh, the farm collectives, um, uh, they there were people from different religions and uh, castes, mm -hmm. and the way they got over that was there were instances when some of the upper caste women said, "Well, we're not going to have a meeting and have tea in the low caste women's members' house," and then the idea was, "Well, if you're not going to do that, do you really want to be part of the group? You have to choose." And that actually, uh, over time, they adapted. Um, uh, and so um, I think economic self-interest can sometimes beat uh, personal prejudice. Not always. Um, <laughs> and this is a longer conversation. But I think where heterogeneity helped was it expanded the social capital that the women had. 
in terms of their ability because the people who have land are um, you know often of upper caste um uh, and caste problems are less uh, dominant in kerala they are much more dominant in the other collectives that i was talking about in bihar uh, and so on and forming a collective help them uh, actually confront um uh, feudalism uh, i i just want to add that in the in the eastern in eastern india the collective there are all male collectives mixed gender collectives and um all women collectives so it's much more um, heterogeneous in terms of composition and that also means that this is a model which could actually adapt uh in in diverse contexts okay. um, so so we thank you very much so and we there are a number of questions. questions yes yes there are some yeah. questions and elena is going to read them Yes, we have Thank several you. questions on, on, on YouTube. Uh, many people are congratulating you as well, first of all. Um, and then Mina Kashi uh, Gopinath says, the movement from the village council to the negotiating table is in itself a fascinating trajectory. Thank you, Bina, for a most informative talk. Then um, Bina Pradam says, hi, Bina, very interesting presentation. I enjoyed it very much. It will be great if I can have access to your presentation. Lovely to see you. Um, then afterwards, uh, Shilpa Vasavada says, wonderful, Bina, very good insights of, of impact of women in governance of forestry and group farming on private farms. Um, Annalise Herrera says, amazing lecture. Thank you, Professor Bina. Um, then, um, Kavita Chakravarti says, thank you, Professor Bina, for a wonderful and well-researched and in-depth presentation. Uh, Indira uh, M. says, very good, Professor Bina. Yes, we all know the rationality for the inclusion of women, but very little is explored about what is the impact of this inclusion on gender relations and also outcomes. Would you like to comment on that? Okay, so I have talked about outcomes in terms of economic outcomes and capability, uh, you know, uh, improvement. Um, I talked about it in, in short form, but on uh, so um, gender relations, I only mentioned in passing because I said it improved their uh, relationship within families and in communities. Um, uh, and uh, the what is interesting, I'm sometimes asked, especially in the farm uh, collectives. Uh, that doesn't it create some conflict? Um, how do husbands respond to women setting up their own farms? Um, and uh, it was an interesting um, uh, question. Um, and I found that, uh, you know, one of the methods that the women have that if somebody is absent from work, they have to either have a replacement for that person or they have to pay a fine. And if you see who is replacing the women, so it's family members, daughters, but also sometimes sons and, and husbands um, uh, replace the woman. So they see it as valuable. Um, part of the reason is that the family farms are quite small. So if, you, if women set up group farms, it actually increases the family income. And, uh, and therefore, um, it, uh, it leads to an improvement in gender relations um, within the family. And in the community, they say that they are now respected uh, more. They, have, uh, um, uh, they are seen as farmers. They have autonomy as farmers. They have learned skills. And other women respect them, too, by asking them, you know, if they are not part of the collective, uh, could you tell us, you know, what you know about organic farming or what have you learned about new techniques and so on. So I'm, I'm saying it in brief because it's, uh, I've written about it in, in, in substantial length, um, especially in my Journal of Peasant Studies uh, paper, which goes into more depth on questions of gender relations. You know, I use Nancy Fraser's um, redistribution <clears throat> recognition and, and uh, representation framework uh, to explore it. Bina, um, there are more questions, but I would like to uh, to make you uh, one. How are you, uh, or how uh, how will all these neoliberal reforms that uh, Modi is uh, implementing, what how they will change this uh, um, the, this uh, the, the economic uh, structural and the gender and how, how they will improve are they going to improve women or 
or not or what uh, what's your, what's your idea what will happen with all this neoliberal this is the way we are seeing outside but i don't know how do you see uh, inside from 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 the global south especially in india how are you seeing all these uh, gaps between women and men and also one of the things that um that I did, well, I was seeing some data of the care economy, the time use uh, of women, and they are one of the worst uh, in in India, as as I saw them in some statistics of the World Bank and also in the statistics of the of the global gender gap uh, of the of the uh, of the boss forum. So I don't know how 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 you are seeing this and how will. And after all this COVID and pandemia, how they are being? What, what's happening <laughs> right now? You, you, you've asked me so many questions. It's a whole basket full of questions. <laughs> I can't answer them all. Um, but um, when you're talking about the reforms, are you talking about the farm laws that have been very much in the news? in recent times? Is that, uh, is that what you're talking about, Elisa? Because, you know, neoliberal reforms can cover <clears throat> many, many things, and there isn't time to talk about that. Uh, but on the farm laws, you see, there are a few things that um, uh, that could be said. Uh, firstly, um, I don't think these farm laws will benefit the small farmers at all. Um, uh, and uh, essentially, um, you know, there are uh, three laws, and the first law is really reg sale, sale in regulated markets. And um, the idea is that you can um, open it up and uh, you can also open up private markets outside the regulated markets. Uh, and so the, the government's argument is that you'll have much more freedom because you'll have a freedom of choice. Um, but the fact is that unregulated markets are not small farmer friendly. Um, and uh, the uh, regulated markets, the small, firstly, small farmers typically don't sell at the farm gate and to other players. So hardly 6 to 12 percent of small farmers even sell in the regulated market. Um, a large number of small farmers don't produce enough surplus um, to be big players in the, in, 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 the, in, in the markets in any case. So the figures are very small. Um, but even then, the small farmers uh, in the regulated markets, at least they get information about uh, inputs. They can sometimes get inputs on credit. They get information on technology. They think they get a fair price. Apart from the, um, the minimum support price, they get a fair price because it's an auction um, and it's much more transparent. Um, so, uh, and also if you have a regulated market space, then if you move into higher value products like vegetables and uh, fruits and vegetables, you need cold storage. So it's possible to, to create that. If the state puts in money, it can create that. If you just open up the space, um, then the small players are just going to lose out. Um, and the fear is, uh, let me give you an analogy that um, if you have a lot of private schools and your government, you have government schools, somebody can answer that, well, it increases your choice. But what tends to happen is that the better off put their children into private schools and the government schools then deteriorate and decline because they don't get access to the same infrastructure, they don't get the same attention, the parents are not there to push the teachers to perform and so on. So you get a decline. So when you have this kind of, so if that's an analogy that you have private markets and then your uh, regulated markets can go into a decline. Um, so uh, the, 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 then there are contracts, uh, the uh, other law is about contracts and small farmers don't gain by contracts. They can gain if they form groups. So if you form farm collectives, they would be better able to, to negotiate. But as individual farmers, they're not able to do that. Um, so I won't go into too much detail because one can talk about the farm laws for a long time. What's important is that women have been very much a part of the movements uh, protesting the laws. Uh, and um, there was, um, in fact, uh, I wrote an article um, in one of the popular magazines because there was a remark by the um, uh, by the uh, um, in 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 the by uh, the um, in the uh, in the law uh, there was a remark that oh women uh, should uh, women and children should be sent back from the protests. 
um, without recognizing that these are women farmers. I mean, these are these women have have stake um, in the uh, in in the in the protest because they are affected by the farm laws. In fact, women are more affected because they are much more dependent on agriculture than men. Uh, so uh, what has happened is that it has really brought out very visibly the face of the woman farmer. Typically in family farms, they're invisibilized. But in, in these protests, you can actually see them in hundreds and hundreds. Also driving tractors, by the way, um, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the, um, they will be affected. But I must say that the demand by women is not for land rights. I mean, the demand um, uh, at this point is really joining the men against the laws. Um, the Jacoba had raised the issue of women's land rights, and that's a complex and, and very important issue for women farmers. Um, and what is often striking is that women, when women join protest movements, um, the demand for their rights in land is not very commonly raised. However, several of the, of the people who uh, have joined this seminar, including Shilpa and others, um, have been uh, very, uh, have played a very important role uh, in India uh, in, uh, in trying to ensure that the laws are implemented. The uh, time use data, you know, it's, uh, most care work is done by women uh, is, is common. That burden has increased under COVID, except in middle-class families where you do have some information to show that men started uh, sharing housework because domestic help was no longer oh. available. But, um, but that was temporary uh, because uh, subsequent research um, data that's come out uh, from another data set in August of last year shows that most of them have gone back to the uh, previous patterns. Um, so, um, so that's that's a social norm which is going to take a lot a lot of time to change. And there are strong class dimensions, obviously, because if you're a well-off woman, then you can pass that burden on to domestic help, but also female domestic help. Bina, um, it, has been, yeah. it, it has been amazing your uh, this conversation. I think Thank you. Are there any other one? comments uh, uh, that need to be very quickly uh, asked? Yes. There are more uh, more questions, uh, but we are. Uh, I have. Uh, um, and Elena is going to say the, she, she's going to pre, she prepared some some words, and I think we have to continue with with this conversation because yes. uh, I don't know. If, well, we have a di diplomado in Asian studies. And we have a part of India. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and but you, we have to to begin continuing with this interchange because uh, in India, even even Jacobo has given us a course about India because he has been living there and he has just finished an article that he, it was published in the Indian Journal Review and now he's preparing another about the financial system in India. But also I think we have to continue with this conversation because we have learned a lot about far, the, the for, for forest and the farm and all these things that not many people, even, even I didn't know how it is uh, uh, how, how it is divided, this work and all the collectiveness that it is in India. So um, I think this is just like, a, I don't know how to say in English, like a suspiro. Okay, uh, I get it. A little, some, a little uh, taste, some, some, uh, a little taste, a taste, a taste of, of, of India. Right. But I think that um, we have to continue. I, I'm really very glad that you accept the invitation. Thank you. Uh, and also, maybe we can. I have well, I have a lot of ideas, but maybe we can. Have, so we can do it. We can do an email exchange on that. Yes, an email, and also uh, we can have like um, four. Or, or we have to divide some talks, maybe two, three, to learn more about India. And if you uh, well, we will invite you, but. Uh, we will think what will be the best way to learn let's, more let's about, talk about India it. and let's talk. Well, I, I will pass the microphone to Anelena. Okay. Anelena, please. Yes. 
Well, thank, thank you very much, Alicia. Um, Ina, it has been fantastic listening to you. I think we, yeah, okay. Um, there, there are so many ideas that are so suggestive, and uh, especially if we think of Mexico, no? and the way in which some of these ideas can be uh, implemented, or maybe they already are, I don't know, um, but that by communicating between countries such as India and Mexico, uh, more and more can be achieved. No? Um, it has been an honor, Bina, to have you here with us. You have aroused so much interest in, in many different channels. And um, uh, we certainly look forward to continuing this collaboration and to expanding it. Uh, it has been very, very inspirational. And uh, thank you to all the people who have been with us. We had um, uh, in the different channels, uh, several dozen people, uh, at least uh, uh, 50 on our part, but we are going to see on the others. Uh, I'm sure that we reached uh, quite a few number of people. And um, uh, I remind uh, our audience that uh, the talks will remain uh, there for, for the future consultation. And hopefully at some point we will be able to, to um, have some Spanish subtitles so that uh, non-English speakers in Mexico and other right. Spanish speaking countries thank will you. be able to, to access them. Um, thank you, Jacobo, for, for such an insightful commentary. It, it was really yeah. interesting to, to hear your, your reaction. And yes, as Alicia was saying, I think uh, there is so much that, that we would like to talk about with you. So uh, let's look forward thank you. to that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jacobo. And I didn't know you were uh, writing about India as well, but those were really amazing uh, uh, comments uh, and you know we need to carry forward the conversation uh, and you and of course you must get in touch when you're in India next um, and then you know there will be a post-COVID time uh, and Alicia uh, it's been wonderful and Anna you know to connect across through Zoom through technology it's like sitting and talking almost and not quite you can't smell the coffee I'm drinking but uh, <laughs> uh, but imagine you know Mexico uh, how many hours away it is and yet we are here together and Anna thank you so much for your very patient and wonderful um, organizing and bringing bringing all of us together uh, and Vanya as well. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you, thank thank you. you Bina.